This podcast is a quest for well-being, a quest for a meaningful life through the exploration of fundamental truths, enlightening ideas, insights on physical, mental, and spiritual health. The inspiration is love. The aspiration is to awaken new ways of thinking that can lead us to a new way of being, being well. Welcome to Body, Mind, and Soul Healing Conversations. According to recent figures, back pain now has reached epidemic proportions, with millions of people across the globe experiencing severe muscular pain every year. In fact, over 4 million people now search lower back pain into Google every month. Most are suffering completely unnecessarily, as the root cause of their pain stems primarily from poor postural habits while performing everyday actions. But help is at hand with Back in Balance an easy-to-understand, practical book designed to help readers discover the cause of their own individual back problem and offer them an effective and lasting solution to their suffering. This essential guide draws on many of the principles of the Alexander Technique, a practical way of releasing muscular tension throughout the body, helping the reader to discover how their posture and movements may be having a detrimental effect on their health this guide offers new ways of performing daily activities with the aim of reducing muscular tension and stress on the bones and joints and making their lives pain-free. The experience of the Alexander Technique actually puts you in touch with your own true essence, an experience that some people may not have had since childhood. It can give us the power to alter our consciousness, which can allow spontaneous gratitude to take the place of negative thinking. Since our consciousness has no limits, there is no end to how attentive or appreciative we can be of this amazing existence. The more aware we are, the more alive we feel, and the greater our capacity to enjoy life will be. As the process of change starts to take place, back pain, fear, and worry simply evaporate by themselves. Valeria Tellez interviews Richard Brennan, the author of Back in Balance, use the Alexander Technique to combat neck, shoulder, and back pain. Richard Brennan has studied the Alexander Technique since 1983 and has been teaching the technique full-time for over 30 years. He travels extensively internationally, giving workshops, talks, and interviews about the technique. Richard has been featured in numerous newspapers and magazines, including the Irish Times, the Sunday Tribune, the Irish Examiner, Cosmopolitan, Hello, and Home and Country. He has appeared on television in the UK, Ireland, Croatia, and Montenegro. He has also been featured on BBC Radio's 4 and 5, as well as many local radio stations in Europe. He has written eight books on the Alexander Technique, Posture and Health, which have been translated into 22 languages, including French, Italian, Spanish, Russian, Korean, and Hebrew, and are on sale worldwide. They have sold over 250,000 copies and include How to Breathe, Change Your Posture, Change Your Life, and The Alexander Workbook. Richard has been actively campaigning in the UK and Ireland for the removal of backward sloping furniture in schools since 1992 because he has personally discovered that they are often a major cause of poor posture and subsequent back, neck, and breathing problems. Richard lives in Galway, Ireland, where he is the director of the Alexander Teacher Training College, Ireland, STAT approved. He is also the past president and co-founder of the Irish Society of Alexander Technique Teachers, ISSAT. Meet Richard Brennan at alexander.ie. Here is the interview with Richard Brennan. In your own words, who is Richard Brennan? 
I, my name is Richard Brennan. I live in Galway in Ireland. I, I'm an Alexander teacher and I also train people to be, become Alexander teachers. I have a teacher training program in Galway on the west coast of Ireland. That sounds wonderful to me. And I have read your book and it's wonderful, the messages, the techniques, yeah. the, um, uh, the awareness exercise is, is just beautiful. Thank you for what you do. A lot of people have not heard of the technique, or if they have, they have a misconception of what it is. In other words, if I go into a cafe or a pub, I meet people and they say, what do you do? I say, oh, I teach the Alexander Technique. They immediately sit up straight. Uh-huh. Yeah, and basically they tense every single muscle in their body. Right. So I say to them, well, you've heard of it then. And they said, yes, it's all about relaxation and posture. Mm. So they have this misconception that good posture means holding yourself rigid in an upright position. Whereas what the technique is, is we have this wonderful posture when we were children. And due to life pressures and going to school and sitting at desks, we lose we lose that, that lovely upright posture. So it's about regaining that again. It's about releasing muscle tension that's built up over many years to be able to move more freely and more easily and with more grace and poise. I love that. In becoming aware of our habits, it's very important, right, Richard? Absolutely. And and people don't even know they have habits. <laughs> true. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So true. Another question I have for you, I have so, too many questions here, but um, this one, what is your idea of balance? What is your definition of balance? There's a balance of posture, when if you look at children when they squat down they are in perfect balance but there's also a balanced life in other words some most of us these days i'm finding that people are out of balance they're rushing around from place to place they haven't got enough time and then the next minute they have too much time so they were just watching tv all the time so i find the balanced life is one where you're You're in control of your life and you're in control of what you actually do mentally, physically and and emotionally. Yeah, it's a kind of calmness and it's basically uh, at peace with yourself, a stillness, a stillness inside yourself. Mm, I love that. And it sounds spiritual to me. Do you have any spiritual belief systems or uh, practices? I have a spiritual, even at the age of 19, I had a spiritual teacher. Yeah. Uh, I learned meditation as well before I even did the Alexander Technique. I really love Ram Dass. I love what he says. Mm. I don't know if you've heard of Ram Dass. Yes. I, lo- I love the idea of not taking anything too seriously, even these two years of COVID. I know it's been very difficult for some people, but again, it's not. It, people have got very serious and they got very depressed about it. And now it's all passing on, and now we're into war, war with Ukraine, and, and and it's always one thing after another. But just to stay above all that, it's like the old Indian philosophy of being like the lotus, which floats on the water and doesn't get dragged down into it. Ah, oh, yes, a billion times <laughs> to that truth. And how did you discover the Alexander technique, Richard? Well, I had a back problem myself. This is why I, I like to write the book about the back, because it, this was my problem. I used to teach people to drive, and sitting down all day long gave me a back, bad back. And I saw many people. The first person I went to see was my father, because he was a doctor. He said, look, there's only one thing we can do, and that's painkillers or muscle relaxants. So I took the painkillers, it got a little bit better, but then after a few months, the painkillers didn't work. So they just gave me stronger painkillers and they didn't work. And then in the end, I was taking the strongest painkillers available and that didn't work. So then I was ending up in an orthopedic surgeon and he took x-rays. There was no MRIs in those days, it was 30 years ago. He injected radioactive fluid down the spine and then took x-rays of my spine. And they found that the three bottom discs didn't exist anymore. They were worn away completely. And it was bone upon bone, and they were trapping nerves. And that nerve was the tactic nerve going down to the left leg. So I, every step I took, I was in excruciating pain. 
So I couldn't walk. I couldn't. I couldn't. I had no social life. I couldn't go out. I couldn't climb stairs. So um, and the the only thing he said we can do is we can remove the remnants of the disc and fuse the vertebrae. And he said you won't be able to bend, but at least you'll be out of pain. So I signed up for the operation. But when I talked to my father, who was a GP in England, he said, whatever you do, don't have the operation because I see the people afterwards. And most of them are actually worse afterwards than before. So that didn't give me any hope. And so I canceled the operation. And then I went down a very interesting path of all the complementary therapies you can think of. Osteopathy, chiropractic, acupuncture, homeopathy, Bowen's technique, spiritual healing, you name it, and I, and I did it. Some of them gave me a little relief for a few days, but most of them didn't give any relief at all. And I finally gave up, but I just happened to bump into an Alexander teacher. He was living in the same house I was. And he said, look, I will give you a free lesson. If he charged me, I probably wouldn't have done it because I, I got fed up with all the failures. But the first thing he said to me was, do you always sit like that? And I was I was astonished. I, I was taken aback. I didn't know what he was talking about. And so I said to him, sit like what? He said, well, you're, you're leaning way over to the left and your shoulder is coming forward. So... I, I said, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm perfectly straight. I feel perfectly straight. So he just showed me in the mirror, and it was he was correct. I was leaning way over to the left, maybe 20 degrees. And I realized after the few lessons that that's what you do when you teach people to drive. You're in the UK where I was teaching. You, you're sitting on the left-hand side of the car and twisting round and making sure that they look in the mirror. So all I got was I got this very strong habit of twisting and leaning to one side, which was then wearing the disc cell in the in the bad furniture, uh, car seat, which was dipping back. So the combination of the car seat and me twisting was wearing my spine out. And then he just came round. He just very gently, very gentle, hardly touched me at all. But he did a little bit of movement of the head. And I felt I was falling off the chair the other way. But when he put the mirror back, I could see I was perfectly straight. So I had this as this faulty sense where I was in space. And after a few lessons, I was absolutely amazed that my father, who was a very good GP, and all the orthopedic surgeons, all the physios, all the chiropractors, all the osteopaths, hadn't looked at me. They were looking inside my body, not at the body. So they didn't see this leaning. They weren't looking for a leaning. They were. You know, and I find a lot of people when they got backache, they're leaning backwards. They're, they're, they're straightening up and leaning backwards. And that leaning backwards or leaning to the side is what's causing the pain. So when people realize that, they can, they can in control of their own body and then they can be out of pain within minutes. You know, literally, I immediately wanted to go down and help people who were having the same problem that I was. Yeah, how wonderful. And I'm glad you did. <laughs> You're helping so many people just by reading and listening to you, of course, and reading your book. It's just so insightful because it's so true. We fail to become aware of what the body is doing. And, and we look for problems. We feel the problem, the pain, and then we want to fix the pain with medications mm -hmm. and do things. But It's actually, we are the only ones that can correct our own problems. I love this idea that the healing is self-healing. All healing is self-healing. Mm -hmm. Do you agree, Richard? Yeah, I do. I do. I, I, I think even when you take medicine, you've got to find out the right medicine for you. And I'm a big believer in the food you eat is your best medicine you can take. It's a food you eat, and you choose the food you eat. You choose the food you eat. So it's the same thing. You choose your habits. You don't choose them consciously. You choose them unconsciously. The lifestyle we're at, at the moment, is people are going so fast. They're doing too much in too little time, and they have no time to be aware of themselves. Mm. And that's the first thing I would teach people on an Alexander lesson, just to lie down for 15 or 20 minutes a day and start to become aware of your pelvis, the back, your neck, 
uh, your breathing, just come back to yourself and put some attention on yourself. Mm. Especially if you have neck problems or back problems, because it is the over tension of muscles that are pulling things together inside the body and causing the problems. Yeah, what a powerful message. Recently, I have developed neck pain and I feel the nerves is like really not good. It's getting better now. The more I become aware and then it's, it's getting better. But it's interesting how, how we let pain progress. And sometimes we feel comfortable with pain, right, Richard? We get used to it, to live in pain. Yeah, yeah. And, and we don't realize if you have a pain in the neck, you say, I have a bad neck. Yeah. You don't, right. you don't say I'm doing something bad to my neck. Mm, and right. that's the case. And then if someone has a bad back or a bad neck which comes on, I would encourage them to say, I wonder what I've been doing mm, yes. for that neck problem. Well, I've been at my computer and it's very stressful at work and my head is poking forward towards the screen and I have I don't realize I'm I'm focused on the screen and not on myself. So true. It is my case a lot of times. <laughs> That's for sure. And it's amazing when we become aware of these things, how simple it is. Yeah, it is simple. It is really simple. You know, we, we have to stop doing what we're doing to cause our own problems. But the but when they see, you are responsible for it, but having some help in that direction, because if I say to people listening to your, your podcast, you need to be start to become aware of yourself. They don't know where to start. Right, right. They don't know where to start. So just having some lessons in how to start bringing that tension back from the outside world to yourself and noticing, noticing things like your breathing, you know, just paying attention to it. It changes the breathing. It changes it. Mm, wow. Just learning to breathe out a little bit longer than you normally would because most people are not giving out their full breath. They're taking a breath before the out breath has even finished. So, so true. And speaking of support and getting to learn more of the Alexander Technique, besides your book, which you have written others too, the one that I read, Back in Balance, use the Alexander Technique to combat neck, shoulder and back pain. It's truly wonderful. It's very clear too. So besides the book, do you also meet people in person? The title is somewhat misleading because it's not just neck, shoulders and back. Mm. It's everything. Right. It's absolutely everything. There's a really interesting story of George Bernard Shaw, the famous writer. He approached Alexander when he was 80 years of age. He had knee problems and ankle problems and hip problems and he had a very bad back and shoulder and neck problems. But on top of all that, he got a heart problem and the doctors gave him three or four weeks to live. So a friend of his said, why don't you, I think it was Aldous Tuckley said, look, why don't you go and try to get some help with Alexander? So he went along and when George Benishaw got to Alexander's house, he had to get up three steps to ring the doorbell. He couldn't do that. He couldn't get up the three steps. He had to stop a passerby to help him up the three steps to ring the doorbell. And then he came in and he slumped in the chair and Alexander took one look at him. He was in a really bad way. He really was in a bad way. And Alexander took one look at him and said, I'm not sure I could help you unless you came every day for three weeks. Mm, right. So after three weeks, George Bernard Shaw wrote Alexander a letter and this is how it went. Dear Mr. Alexander, thank you for all your help. All my aches and pains have gone and the doctors can't find the heart problem anymore. I'm swimming every morning and walking five miles a day and I feel better and fitter than I did when I was 30. However, you have left me with one problem I didn't have in the first place. Hmm. Now that I'm three inches taller, that's about eight centimeters, none of my suits fit me anymore. Mm -hmm. You have to take all his suits back to the tailor <laughs> and have them remeasured. Right. It cost him a fortune. Oh, okay? my God. Okay, he grew three <laughs> inches wow. at the age of 80 when most people are shrinking. Right. And all of that was muscle tension. The muscles were pulling him down. And then he didn't live for three weeks or three years. He lived for another 14 years. Wow. 
Wow. And when he, the way he died is interesting too, because he fell out of an apple tree while picking apples. Oh, at, wow. At the age of 94. Amazing. Okay? So he came from being a crappy, basically old man to a new lease of life, just from releasing that muscle tension. Because when people get old, they say, oh, I'm becoming stiffer. That stiffness is the muscles getting tighter. And we don't realize that. And and it's not the case in India. If you go to India, you'll see people at the age of 80 squatting on the floor doing their housework. They squat when they're talking to people at the market. And they never lose that feeling of flexibility. Of a lot of the problems we have when we get older is just over tightening of the muscular system. And we don't realize we're doing it. The head is another insightful idea. I mean, it's true to me that... The body, it's healing. It's a healing machine, as you call it. You, in your book, you say that. It heals itself, so and it needs to be relaxed for that to happen. There's a lot to do with relaxation. We have lost the way when it comes to relaxation in our societies today. Yeah. It's, it's quite the opposite, right, Richard? Yeah, the, the, the body, uh, as far as Alexander was concerned, was a reflection of actually how we are. You know, if somebody has a lot of responsibilities and working very hard, they have shoulder problems. And we actually say they have a lot of responsibilities on his shoulders. They don't say he has a lot of responsibilities in his hip or in his knee. Right. So different places in the body, I think Louise Hay talked a lot about it, different places in the body are reflections of different conditions and different ways of thinking. Right. So uh-huh. Alexander was a, one of the first people to actually identify this, that the mind and the body and the emotions are all one thing. He didn't call it body connection. It's not like the body affects the mind and the mind affects the body. He said they're one thing. They are part of one thing, which is you. So if I have a problem with the body, it's usually because I'm thinking in a certain way. Right, right. Or, or maybe I'm having emotional problems or something, then the body starts to play up. So, so true. And Alexander, his problem was not a back problem. He had a voice problem, right, Richard? That surprised me too. He didn't have any pain. He just lost his voice when he was on stage. He was an actor. So the whole thing came out of theater. And basically what he was doing when he was acting as he was trying so hard, because there was no microphones in 1800s, when he went to bigger halls, he got very good reputation. He had bigger theatres. He had to project his voice further. But he did it by force. He did it by pushing his voice out. And as he pushed his voice out, he would throw back his head and depress the larynx. And he would lose his voice altogether. And he did realise that it was just, and it became a very strong habit. So he learned, he saw this in the mirror, and he learned that he needed to not try so hard. I wonder what the balance is, Richard, when it comes to doing what we need to do and relaxing at the same time. Is it possible to work, to do what we love to do, and at the same time carry this sense of relaxation? Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you just take the example of children... They, they are running all over the place, but they're not running because they're late. They're mm. running because they like to, they like <laughs> yeah. to move fast. It's true. <laughs> and that's different. The difference is, I, yeah, of course I can go for a run. I can, I can move fast. I can, that's what I love to do, but I'm not feeling compelled to do it, and I'm not tensing my muscles at the same time. It's when I'm feeling this rush, then, then the muscles really tighten up. In fact, a lot of runners do the Alexander technique to get faster. A lot of swimmers, a lot of sports people do the technique to free the muscles so they can actually move faster. But the muscles have to be relaxed at the same time. So a relaxed muscle is, is actually a more powerful muscle. Like a relaxed mind as well, right? It's a more yeah. powerful mind, I agree. Yeah. Talk to me for a moment about the um, Back in Balance online course that your publisher is releasing based on the content of the book. When this will be released and how will that work? Videos, you will be presenting this live? Well, the book is on Amazon or in a very bookshop and it's, it's a paperback book and you can read it. But some people like to have the information more visual. 
And so the Watkins, who published the book, has also got me to do an online course, which is 10 lessons. And I talk through the major points in the book. And you also get a online copy of the actual book itself. It's a PDF. So you get the book as well. And then you and you can play these lessons. Once you've brought it, you can play them as many times as you like. So you can read the book, then go to the online course, see the information visually and me explaining it. And then they go back to the book. And then I just find it goes in deeper. The information goes in deeper. It makes it clearer. Going back to the your work in the book, I love the awareness exercise throughout the book. And I also love that you focus on the big picture, awareness itself of mind and, and body, not as a connection, but as a system, as a whole mm -hmm. system. It's really a beautiful message for all of us. What I, I mean, insightful work, Rachel, I keep saying that because it is. Thank you for what you do and how you do it. Well, it's very simple. It really is simple. I, 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 First of all, I use my hands to find out where the muscle tension is and where people are holding it. And then I make them aware of where they, they're holding with my hands and with, with my verbal instructions. I say, can you feel you're holding the tension in the shoulder maybe? And they say, no, first of all. And I say, well, can you feel the difference between the two shoulders? And they go, oh, I guess I think I can. And then I will show them in the mirror. Mm -hmm. And then they, in the mirror, they can actually see it. They can actually see, oh, one shoulder is more forward or one shoulder is more up or my head is leaning to one side. And then they just become to become more aware of it. And then, we, like I said, we do the lying down. And because there's no reason for the muscle to tense while you're lying down, if there's any tension left after you lay down, it becomes very obvious. And then I would move an arm or a leg around to see if that arm or leg is free to move. If I did this with children, their limbs are very, very easy and free to move. But most adults, they, 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 they are stiffening. They're stiffening. Yeah. And I had one person who came uh, to me about a few weeks ago. And I said, why are you here? And he said, oh, I don't know. My wife sent me. Mm -hmm. And she said she thinks I'm too tense. Yeah. But I don't think I'm tense at all. So I lay him on the table. I went to lift his arm. I couldn't move it. Mm. It was so tense. And he couldn't feel that. Because the muscle spindles in the muscle, if the muscle is too tense, it starts to cut out all the information going to the brain. Mm. So I can hold the tension and I can be completely oblivious of it. And then suddenly I pick something up like a pen and my whole back goes. Mm. Yeah. That tension has been there many years, and it's just the straw that broke the camel's back. Right. In the book, you talk about, there's a section, I think it's um, chapter six, faulty sensory awareness, where mm -hmm. you also talk about the faulty sensory appreciation. So I'd love to hear more about that, Richard. Okay, well, this is what Alexander discovered. He was throwing his head back. He could see he was throwing his head back in the mirror. Yeah. He decided if I put my head forward, my problem will be gone. When he put his head forward, his hoarseness become worse. And he couldn't understand why. So he went back to the mirror to look. And he realized that when he was putting his head forward, he was only putting his chin forward. And if you put your chin forward, your head goes back even more. So so then he realized, oh, this is a personal idiosyncrasy. It's my own personal problem. There's something wrong with my body. But when he came to teach people, he realized that everyone had the same thing. Wow. So when people stand up straight, they're not straight. They're usually leaning backwards. And my awareness is, is faulty and partly because I hold so much tension in the muscles that the muscle spindles don't work and aren't relaying the information back to the brain correctly. So unless I'm using a mirror, I can't really tell, or a camera, or a you know like um, you know some form of external reflection. I can't tell where I am in space. So people think they're doing one thing and they're really doing something else. And if you talk to any yoga teachers, they will all say the same thing. They say, "I demonstrate this yoga posture," and then I look around the room and everyone's doing something different. Mm -hmm, yes. <laughs> okay. So that's because yeah. everyone is. <laughs> thinking they're doing the same thing, but they're really doing something different. Yeah. yeah. Wow, yeah. How, how incredible. Um, to mm -hmm. become 
self-aware to this point where we don't need the external, like say, reflection, that is incredible, isn't it? We, we can feel, actually, when we are doing something that the body is not comfortable with. Yeah, uh, I was just going to say, this is one of the things that I, I is not addressed in any other physical system. If you go and do yoga or you do tai chi or you run or you swim, there, there's no form of anyone that's considering they may be doing something that they have no idea that they're actually doing. So it can, it, it's very, very valuable for all these systems. It doesn't matter whether you do yoga or run or to go down the gym or do whatever you do in form of exercise. It, it, can, it can really heighten and improve whatever you do. Thank you again for being open to life and doing what you do, helping so many people. You're welcome. You're welcome. In the book, you said something funny at the same time. You give an example of a man with a headache because he's constantly banging his head against the wall. And then you ask a question like, what would you do? Advise him, give him some painkillers? Would you um, give him a crash helmet? <laughs> Or would you tell him to bang his head against something softer? Then you say, of course not. You naturally would tell him to stop banging his head on the wall, and that would certainly improve and probably even cure his headache. Then you say, like that man, most people do not have a bad back. We are just doing something bad to it, as you said earlier. So that was yeah. a funny example you give in the, in the book, but it's so true. So, so true. Love the, uh, the chapter on sitting comfortably. That's a question. Are you sitting comfortably? You ask that question. That's a very insightful chapter. And then the power of habit is another one. Um, and then there is a quote where you say, I think in the very beginning, change involves carrying out an activity against the habit of life. That was by Alexander. And then the common unhealthy habits, you also list them, lots of them there. That's great to know. And I have a question for you. Maybe I have missed this in the book, but what about sleeping habits? Like I have had bad sleeping habits for a while. In my back, I would wake up with back pain. And then I changed the position that I slept, and then it changed. Everything changed. A sleeping habit, well, when you're asleep, you move about 15, about 15 times every night, maybe every 15 or 20 minutes, you're actually moving. So right. people go to sleep on their side and they wake up on their back. I have children. And when I came in the room and see them sleeping, they're in all sorts of positions. So it's not so much the position you want to be. It, it, Alexander said, people use themselves at night, much more at night than during the day. Mm. But there's nothing you can do about it at night, but there's plenty you can be, do about it during the day. So if you go about your daily tasks in a calm way and with relaxed muscles, you'll get a good night's sleep. Yeah. If you, you know, I used to wake myself up every night when I used to be a driving instructor, pushing down with my leg, trying to find the jaw controls. Yeah. <laughs> because I was dreaming, I was dreaming, I was, le you know, teaching people to drive. Yeah. So this is what happens. Everything we do in the, in the daytime comes out at, during our, through our dreams. Mm. So we can wake up thinking, oh, where are all my files gone? I've lost all my files and <laughs> our shoulders are up by our ears. <laughs> yeah. So uh, <laughs> if you live a calm and life and a steady life and a balanced life, then you will have a balanced sleep. Mm. Yes, just, right. It's a follow on from that. There's nothing you can do about it while you're asleep because you're completely unconscious. Uh, some of the habits, basically sitting on really bad furniture is one habit. We don't realize that the backward sloping chairs we sit on uh, cause the whole pelvis to roll back. And then we're having to pull our back in to sit up trade. And, and those backward sloping chairs are in sofas, they're in car seats, they're all over the place. And we don't realize we're sitting on them. Right. So, and then we, uh, another bad habit would be the way we stand. A lot of people, they, they don't stand on both feet. They stand sinking down into one hip. Yeah. Uh, and leaning backwards is another one that really is very bad for the back. Because if all the time you're leaning backwards, you're holding a lot of tension in the lower back. 
Mm. Yeah. Right, right. Uh, and also leaning forward without bending the knees. So in other words, picking something up by when you're not bending the knees, when you come back up, you're having to pick up your two thirds of your body weight with your with your lower back muscles. So so children would never do that. They would always bend their knees to go down and pick something up off the floor. We need to do learn to do the same thing. Uh, well, eating too fast is one. Eating on the run is another. Uh, and also, you know, people just eat because of the taste of the food. They're not really thinking too much about what you eat as your fuel for your body. And I'm a big fan. I don't know if you come across the China study. I'm a big fan of the China study. It was a 10 year, uh, took, sorry, 25 year research program at Cornell University. And they found that certain foods are the root cause of cancer and heart problems and diabetes and strokes. And to avoid certain foods, uh, just keep you much healthier and keep you alive much longer. And I think it's really, after the technique, it's my second love. So, yeah, just eating what is good for you. And we all know what's good for us. We know that, you know, when we eat the rubbish food, it, it, we don't feel good afterwards. And when we feel, you know, maybe fruit and vegetables, they make us actually feel, they make us feel empowered. But yeah. also we need to get in the habit of eating those foods as well. So true. Another habit. Yeah. But there's good habits and not so good habits. Huh. So, you know, if we can have some good habits, then that's great. Yeah. And they're chosen habits. Most of the habits that we don't even choose, they're just inside the body. As you said before, everything's connected. So it's one system, right? We are almost at the end. Thank you so much again for what you do and how you do it. Um, your work is beautiful and it's generous, it's okay, clear. I want to make this comment about the champagne feeling <laughs> that you have in the book. You called it, I think it was a student of yours, right, Richard, that called the um, champagne that experience in the Alexander technique, it feels like champagne. <laughs> that was interesting to read that. It, it is so simple. It, it is so simple. Alexander said, I can teach my technique to a three-year-old child in five minutes. Wow. And give me, but give me an adult and God help me because we complicate everything. It's very simple. If I just leave you with this thing, we are doing things with, in a certain way that cause lots of tension in the body. We need to become aware of that tension and change the way we do things. And then, and then the problem goes away. You know, we can be leaning backwards, giving ourselves a back problem. We go to the doctor and next thing we know, we're on a list of some hip operation or back operation. Mm, right. They start take, you know, cutting this out. What, what we need to do is learn how to stand properly, because even if we have the operation, we haven't changed the habit. So two years later, you're going to need another operation. Mm, so true. Yeah. 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 As simple as that. Yeah. I keep just, saying that. Yeah, yeah. It, it such yeah. sounds true. <laughs> Everything yeah. the way you say it, and yeah. it is simple. Thank you so yeah. much again, Richard. You're welcome. I'll have your website on the podcast profile, and okay. I'll have the book too linked to Amazon, and we'll be mm -hmm. in touch. Thank you so much for your presence here today. You're very welcome. Very welcome. Bye for you. now, Richard. Bye, bye now. Bye. Thank you for listening. To learn more about Richard Brennan and his work, please visit alexander.ie. To learn more about this podcast, please visit fitforjoy.org slash podcast. Thank you again for listening and bye for now.